Section four of Love Letters of Dorothy Osborne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Love Letters of Dorothy Osborne, Section four. Letter sixteen. Sir, if it were the carrier's fault that you stayed so long for your letters, you are revenged. I have chid him most unreasonably. But I must confess t'was not for that, for I did not know it then. But going to meet him, as I usually do, when he gave me your letter, I found the upper seal broken open, and underneath, where it uses to be only closed with a little wax, there was a seal, which, though it were an anchor and a heart, methought did not look like yours, but less and much worse cut. This suspicion was so strong upon me that I chid till the poor fellow was ready to cry, and swore to me that it had never been touched since he had it. And he was careful of it, as he never put it with his other letters, but by itself, and that now it come amongst his money, which perhaps might break the seal. And lest I should think it was his curiosity, he told me very ingenuously he could not read and so we parted for the present. But since he has been with a neighbour of mine, whom he sometimes delivers my letters to, and begged her that she would go to me and desire my worship to write to your worship, to know how the letter was sealed, for it has so grieved him that he has neither ate or slept, to do him any good, since he came home. And in grace of God this shall be a warning to him as long as he lives." He takes it so heavily that I think I must be friends with him again. But pray hereafter seal your letters, so that the difficulty of opening them may dishearten anybody from attempting it. It was but my guess that the ladies at Heems were so unhandsome, but since you tell me they were remarkably so, then I know them by it. They are two sisters, and might have been mine if the fates had so pleased. They have a brother that is not like them, and is a baronet beside. It is strange that you tell me of my lord Chandois, Chandus, and Arundel, but what becomes of young Compton's estate? Sure my lady Carey can neither in honour nor conscience keep it. Beside that she needs it less now than ever, her son being, as I hear, dead. So T, I suppose, avoid you as a friend of mine. My brother tells me they meet sometimes, and have the most to do to pull off their hats to one another than can be, and never speak. If I were in town, I'd undertake he would venture the being choked for want of air, rather than stir out of doors for fear of meeting me. But did you not say in your last that you took something very ill from me? If t'was my humble thanks, well, you shall have no more of them, then, nor no more servants. I think that they are not necessary among friends. I take it very kindly that your father asked for me, and that you are not pleased with the question he made of the continuance of my friendship. I can pardon at him, because he does not know me, but I should never forgive you if you could doubt it. Were my face in no more danger of changing than my mind, I should be worth the seeing at three score and that which is but very ordinary now, would then be counted handsome for an old woman. But, alas, I am more likely to look old before my time with grief. Never anybody had such luck with servants. What with marrying and what with dying, they all leave me. Just now I have news brought me of the death of an old rich knight that had promised me this seven years to marry me, whensoever his wife died, and now he's dead before him and has left us such a widow, it makes me mad to think on it. One thousand two hundred a year jointure, and twenty thousand in money and personal estate, and all this I might have had if Mr. Death had been pleased to have taken her instead of him. Well, who can help these things? But since I cannot have him, would you had her? What say you? Shall I speak a good word for you? She will marry for certain." and perhaps, though my brother may expect I should serve him in it, yet if you give me a commission, I'll say I was engaged beforehand for a friend, and leave him to shift for himself. You would be my neighbour if you had her, 
and I should see you often. Think on it, and let me know what you resolve. My lady has written me word that she intends very shortly to sit at Lely's for her picture for me. I give you notice on it, that you may have the pleasure of seeing it sometimes whilst it's there. I imagine twill be so to you, for I am sure it would be a great one to me, and we do not use to differ in our inclinations, though I cannot agree with you that my brother's kindness to me has anything of trouble in it. No, sure, I may be just to you and him both, and to be a kind sister will take nothing from my being a perfect friend. Your faithful friend and servant, Dorothy Osborne. Letter 17 Sir, I received your letter to-day, when I thought it almost impossible that I should be sensible of anything but my father's sickness and my own affliction in it. Indeed, he was then so dangerously ill that we could not reasonably hope he should outlive this day. Yet he is now, I thank God, much better, and I am come so much to myself with it as to undertake a long letter to you whilst I watch by him. Toward the latter end it will be excellent stuff, I believe, but alas, you may allow me to dream sometimes. I have had so little sleep since my father was sick that I am never thoroughly awake. Lord, how I have wished for you! Here do I sit all night by a poor moped fellow that serves my father, and have much ado to keep him awake and myself too. If you heard the wide discourse that is between us, you would swear we wanted sleep. But I shall leave him to-night to entertain himself, and try if I can to write as wisely as I talk. I am glad all is well again. In earnest, it would have lain upon my conscience, if I had been the occasion of making your poor boy lose a service, that if he has the wit to know how to value it, he would never have forgiven me while he had lived. But while I remember it, let me ask you if you did not send my letter and Cleopatra where I directed you for my lady. I received one for her to-day full of the kindest reproaches, but she has not heard from me these three weeks. I have writ constantly to her, but I do not so much wonder that the rest are lost, as she seems not to have received that which I sent to you, nor the books. I do not understand it, but I know there is no fault of yours in it. But mark you, if you think to escape with sending me such bits of letters, you are mistaken. You say you are often interrupted, and I believe it, but you must use then to begin to write before you receive mine. And whensoever you have any spare time, allow me some of it. Can you doubt that anything can make your letters cheap? In earnest, t'was unkindly said, and if I could be angry with you, it should be for that. No, certainly they are, and ever will be, dear to me as that which I receive a huge contentment by. How shall I long when you are gone your journey to hear from you? How shall I apprehend a thousand accidents that are not likely nor will ever happen, I hope? Oh, if you do not send me long letters, then you are the cruellest person that can be. If you love me, you will, and if you do not, I shall never love myself. You need not fear such a command as you mention. Alas, I am too much concerned that you should love me ever to forbid it you. "'Tis all that I propose of happiness to myself in the world. "'The burning of my paper has waked me. "'All this while I was in a dream. "'But tis no matter. "'I am content that you should know they are of you, "'and that when my thoughts are left most at liberty, "'they are the kindest. "'I swear my eyes are so heavy "'that I can hardly see what I write, "'nor do I think you will be able to read it when I have done.' The best on it is twill be no great loss to you, if you do not. For sure the greatest part on it is not sense, and yet on my conscience I shall go on with it. Tis like people that talk in their sleep. Nothing interrupts them but talking to them again, and that you are not like to do at this distance. Beside that, at this instant you are, I believe, more asleep than I, and do not so much dream that I am writing to you. My fellow watchers have been asleep too, till just now they begin to stretch and yawn. They are going to try if eating and drinking can keep them awake, 
and I am kindly invited to be of their company, and my father's man has got one of the maids to talk nonsense to to-night, and they have got between them a bottle of ale. I shall lose my share if I do not take them at their first offer. Your patience shall have drunk, and then I'll for you again. And now on the strength of this ale I believe I shall be able to fill up this paper that's left with something or other, and first let me ask you if you have seen a book of poems newly come out, made by my lady Newcastle. For God's sake, if you meet it, send it to me. They say it is ten times more extravagant than her dress. Sure the poor woman is a little distracted. She could never be so ridiculous else as to venture at writing books, and in verse, too. If I should not sleep this fortnight, I should not come to that. My eyes grow a little dim, though, for all the ale, and I believe if I could see it, this is the most strangely scribbled note. Sure, I shall not find fault with your writing in haste, for anything but the shortness of your letter, and twould be very unjust in me to tie you to a ceremony that I do not observe myself. No, for God's sake, let there be no such thing between us. A real kindness is so far beyond all compliment that it never appears more than when there is least of t'other mingled with it. If then you would have me believe yours to be perfect, confirm it to me by a kind of freedom. Tell me if there be anything that I can serve you in. Employ me as you would that sister you say you love so well. Chide me when I do anything that is not well, but then make haste to tell me that you have forgiven me, and that you are what I shall ever be, a faithful friend. Dorothy Osborn Letter 18 Sir, I have been reckoning up how many faults you lay to my charge in your last letter, and I find I am severe, unjust, unmerciful, and unkind. Oh, me, how should one do to mend all these? Tis work for an age, and tis to be feared I shall be so old before I am good, that twill not be considerable to anybody but myself whether I am so or not. I say nothing of the pretty humour you fancied me in, in your dream, cause twas but a dream. Sure, if it had been anything else, I should have remembered that my Lord L. loves to have his chamber and his bed to himself. But seriously now, I wonder at your patience. How could you hear me talk so senselessly, though it were but in your sleep, and not be ready to beat me? What nice mistaken points of honour I pretended to, and yet could allow him room in the same bed with me. Well, dreams are pleasant things to people whose humours are so, but to have the spleen and to dream upon it is a punishment I would not wish on my greatest enemy. I seldom dream, or never remember them, unless they have been so sad as to put me into such disorder as I can hardly recover when I am awake and some of those I am confident I shall never forget. You ask me how I pass my time here. I can give you a perfect account not only of what I do for the present, but of what I am likely to do this seven years if I stay here so long. I rise in the morning reasonably early, and before I am ready I go round the house till I am weary of that, and then into the garden till it grows too hot for me. About ten o'clock I think of making me ready, and when that's done, I go to my father's chamber, from whence to dinner, where my cousin Mole and I sit in great state in a room, and at a table that would hold a great many more. After dinner we sit and talk till Mr. B. comes in question, and then I am gone. The heat of the day is spent in reading or working and about six or seven o'clock I walk out into a common that lies hard by the house, where a great many young wenches keep sheep and cows, and sit in the shade singing of ballads. I go to them and compare their voices and beauties to some ancient shepherdesses that I have read of, and find a vast difference there. But trust me, I think these are as innocent as those could be. I talk to them and find they want nothing to make them the happiest people in the world but the knowledge that they are so. Most commonly, when we are in the midst of our discourse, one looks about her and spies her cows going into the corn, 
and then away they all run as if they had wings at their heels. I, that am not so nimble, stay behind, and when I see them driving home their cattle, I think tis time for me to return too. When I have supped, I go into the garden, and so to the side of a small river that runs by it, where I sit down and wish you were with me. You had best say this is not kind, neither. In earnest, tis a pleasant place, and would be much more so to me if I had your company. I sit there sometimes till I am lost with thinking, and were it not for some cruel thoughts of the crossness of our fortunes that will not let me sleep there, I should forget that there were such things to be done as going to bed. Since I writ this, my company has increased by two. My brother Harry and a fair niece, the elder of my brother Peyton's children. She is so much a woman that I am almost ashamed to say I am her aunt, and so pretty that if I had any designs to gain of servants, I should not like her company. But I have none, and therefore shall endeavour to keep her here as long as I can, persuade her father to spare her, for she will easily consent to it having so much of my humour, though it be the worst thing in her, as to like a melancholy place and little company. My brother John is not come down again, nor am I certain when he will be here. He went from London into Gloucestershire to my sister, who was very ill, and his youngest girl, of whom he was very fond, is since dead. But I believe that by the time his wife has a little recovered her sickness and loss of her child, he will be coming this way. My father is reasonably well, but keeps his chamber still, and will hardly, I am afraid, be ever so perfectly recovered as to come abroad again. I am sorry for poor Walker, but you need not doubt of what he has of yours in his hands, for it seems he does not use to do his work himself. I speak seriously, he keeps a Frenchman that sets all his seals and rings. If what you say of my Lady Leppington be of your own knowledge, I shall believe you. But otherwise I assure you that I have heard from people that pretend to know her very well, that her kindness to Compton was very moderate, and she never liked him so well as when he died and gave her his estate. But they might be deceived, and it is not so strange as that you should imagine a coldness and indifference in my letter, when I so little meant it. But I am not displeased you should desire my kindness enough to apprehend the loss of it when it is safest. I know I would not have you apprehend it so far as to believe it possible. That were an injury to all the assurances I have given you. And if you love me, you cannot think me unworthy. I should think myself so, if I found you grew indifferent to me, that I have had so long and so particular a friendship for. But sure, this is more than I need to say. You are enough in my heart to know all of my thoughts. And if so, you know better than I can tell you how much I am. Your faithful friend and servant, Dorothy Osborne. Letter 19 Sir, if to know I wish you with me pleases you, tis a satisfaction you may always have, for I do it perpetually, but were it really in my power to make you happy, I could not miss being so myself, for I know nothing else I want towards it. You are admitted to all my entertainments, and it would be a pleasing surprise to me to see you among my shepherdesses. I meet some there sometimes that look very like gentlemen, for tis a road, and when they are in a good humour they give us a compliment as they go by. But you would be so courteous as to stay, I hope, if we entreated you. Tis in your way to this place, and just before the house. Tis our Hyde Park, and every fine evening anybody that wanted a mistress might be sure to find one there. I have wondered often to meet my fair lady rather than there alone. Methinks it should be dangerous for an heir. I could find it in my heart to steal her away myself, but it should rather be for her person than her fortune. My brother says not a word of you, nor your service, nor do I expect he should. If I could forget you, he would not help my memory. You would laugh, sure, if I could tell you how many servants he has offered me since he came down. But one above all the rest, I think he is in love with himself. I may marry him too if he pleases, I shall not hinder him. There's one Talbot, the finest gentleman he has seen these seven years, 
but the mischief on't is he has not above fifteen or sixteen hundred pound a year, though he swears he begins to think one might bait five hundred a year for such a husband. I tell him I am glad to hear it, and if I were as much taken as he with Mr. Talbot, I should not be less gallant. But I doubted the first extremely. I have spleen enough to carry me to Epsom this summer, but yet I think I shall not go. If I make one journey, I must make more, for then I have no excuse. Rather than be obliged to that, I'll make none. You have so often reproached me with the loss of your liberty, that to make you some amends, I am contented to be your prisoner this summer. But you shall do one favour for me into the bargain. When your father goes to Ireland, lay your commands upon some of his servants to get you an Irish greyhound. I have one that was the general's, but tis a bitch, and those are always much less than the dogs. I got it in the time of my favour there, and it was all they had. Henry Cromwell undertook to write to his brother Fleetwood for another for me, but I have lost my hopes there. Whomsoever it is that you employ, he will need no other instruction but to get the biggest he can meet with. Tis all the beauty of those dogs, or of any kind, I think. A master, mastiff, is handsomer to me than the most exact little dog that ever lady played with all. You will not offer to take it ill that I employ you in such a commission, since I have told you that the general's son did not refuse it. But I shall take it ill if you do not take the same freedom with me whensoever I am capable of serving you. The town must needs be unpleasant now, and methinks you might contrive some way of having your letters sent to you without giving yourself the trouble of coming to town for them when you have no other business. You must pardon me if I think they cannot be worth it. I am told that our Spencer is a servant to a lady of my acquaintance, a daughter of my lady at Exeter's. Is it true? And if it be, what has become of the two thousand five hundred pound lady? Would you think it that I have an ambassador from the Emperor Justinian that comes to renew the treaty? In earnest, tis true, and I want your counsel extremely what to do in it. You told me once that of all my servants you liked him the best. If I could do so too, there were no dispute in it. Well, I think, Aunt, I, if it succeed, I will be as good as my word. You shall take your choice of my four daughters. Am not I beholding to him, think you? He says that he has made addresses. Tis true in several places since we parted, but could not fix anywhere. And in his opinion he sees nobody that would make so fit a wife for him as I. He has often inquired after me to hear if I were marrying, and somebody told him I had an ague, and he presently fell sick of one too. So naturally a sympathy there is between us. And yet for all this on my conscience we shall never marry. He desires to know whether I am at liberty or not. What shall I tell him? Or shall I send him to you to know? I think that will be best. I'll say that you are much my friend and I have resolved not to dispose myself but with your consent and approbation, and therefore he must make all court to you, and when he can bring me a certificate under your hand that you think him a fit husband for me, it is very likely I may have him. Till then I am his humble servant and your faithful friend, Dorothy Osborne. Letter 20 Sir, I am sorry my last letter frighted you so. It was no part of my intention it should, but I am more sorry to see by your first chapter that your humour is not always so good as I could wish it. It was the only thing I ever desired we might differ in, and therefore I think it is denied me. Whilst I read the description on it, I could not believe but that I had writ it myself, it was so much my own. I pity you and Ernest much more than I do myself, and yet I may deserve yours when I shall have told you that beside all that you speak of, I have gotten an ague that with two fits has made me so very weak 
that I doubted extremely yesterday whether I should be able to sit up to-day to write to you. But you must not be troubled at this. That's the way to kill me indeed. Besides, it is impossible I should keep at long, for here is my eldest brother and my cousin Mole, and two or three more that have great understanding in Agues, as people that have been long acquainted with them, and they do so tutor and govern me, that I neither to eat or drink or sleep without their leave. And sure, my obedience deserves they should cure me, or else they are great tyrants to very little purpose. You cannot imagine how cruel they are to me, and yet will persuade me tis for my own good. I know they mean it, so, and therefore say nothing on it, I admit, and sigh to think those are not here that would be kinder to me. But you were cruel yourself when you seemed to apprehend that I might oblige you to make good your last offer. Alack! If I could purchase the empire of the world at that rate, I should think it much too dear. And though perhaps I am too unhappy myself ever to make anybody else happy, yet sure I shall take heed that my misfortunes may not prove infectious to my friends. You ask counsel of a person that is little able to give it. I cannot imagine whether you should go, since this journey is broke. You must e'en be content to stay at home, I think and see what will become of us, though I expect nothing of good, and sure you never made a truer remark in your life than that all changes are for the worst. Will it not stay your father's journey too? Methinks it should. For God's sake write me all that you hear or can think of, that I may have something to entertain myself with all. I have a scurvy head that will not let me write longer." I am your faithful friend and servant, Dorothy Osborne. End of section four.